Morning, Grace Bible Church, and we're just uh, so great to be here. We've entered a new phase of this pandemic, and that's the one where you allow uh, one of your family members to take the kitchen shears to your hair based on a four-minute YouTube training video. So I uh, hope you all are doing well. It's, uh, it's been several weeks now, and um, I, I, you know, the thought of getting up here with just me singing with my guitar was uh, a little bit frightening, so I made some family members come up here with me, which, of course introduced a sound system and I, you know, I went overboard and Josh is just loving me this morning on uh, adding all these new little uh, things to his, to his video, but uh, all good. And I uh, hope you just enjoy the worship service this morning. Let's try that again. Can you cut that out? And do it? Oh. <laughs>
you know, he kind of let me go down that path. And then he said, oh, yeah, my sermon is on crushing pride. And I'm like, eh, it's too late to get out now, isn't it? So, but yeah, we're all full of pride. But I find that, you know, when we just let God have our way, have his way, then, um, then all things work out. this morning and just listen to your word and what you have for us this morning and as we sit at our homes um i just ask that you uh, just calm our hearts uh, remove the distractions that we can have uh, around the house and just help us to focus on you this morning in christ's name we pray amen and over to chris main
Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us again for our GBC at Home Sunday service. And I want to thank the Gorman Family Singers plus Paul this weekend. <laughs> Did a great job. Love those songs. Really, I think, set the stage so for where beautiful. we're going right. today in uh, Jeremiah chapter 13. Well, if you bought plants a little bit earlier than normal, hopefully you brought them in last night because temperatures were in the high 20s to low 30s. But I think that's the last day we'll go below freezing. Thank goodness. Hopefully <laughs> until next October. Uh, today should be sunny and mostly temperatures going into the 60s. So I hope you enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Let me turn things over to Amy. She can give us an update on what's going on the rest of today and this yeah. coming week. We have a busy week coming up and we're so excited. So today at four, we have our youth meetup online. If you have friends and want to invite them, that's great. Just let me know. Email the church or give us a call here. And um, tomorrow we have Monday through Friday, our 10 a.m. moms meetup. That would be great if you need information on that, just let me know. We have uh, Tuesday and Thursday, our two o'clock Zoom meeting for kids. And Wednesday we have another youth meetup. So Wednesdays and Sundays. And then we're starting a women's Bible study at 11 o'clock on Tuesday. And then Wednesday, our men's group at 9 a.m. So that's great. I really wanted to thank Dolly for stopping by on Friday and Kevin, great tax information, things that we didn't know. And so we wanted to put that information out there. And Dolly was just a pleasure to have yeah. with her studio and love the music, love the art. It was fantastic. Yes, so, good yeah. stuff. Now the Tuesday study mm -hmm. for women, that's going to be on anxiety and worry and fear. Well, we changed it a little bit, right? So Barb um, felt led to change it to Psalms. And I know a lot of us have been in Psalms for um, worry and anxiety, but just Psalms is just calming our hearts studying through there. So she wanted to take the ladies through a study in Psalms. So fantastic. Yeah, thanks. All right. That'll be starting on Tuesday. Tuesday at 11. The Sunday service last week got such great feedback Phenomenal. and we really appreciated not only that you attended, and everything that went on that weekend and all the folks that help us get set up and carry that out. But what we'd like to do, assuming that this continues to go on, we'd like to do a service like that again in mm -hmm. May. And what we would probably do in order to keep the social distancing and realizing that we're somewhat confined in our parking area is that we would do two services again. This time we probably won't get you out here at seven o'clock in the morning. We'll probably do a 9 o'clock and a 10 o'clock or a 9 and a 10.30. We'll do that in May. We'll keep you posted on when that's going to happen. But we're already excited about, we're thinking Very about excited. how we're going to be able to And a little to more gentle on the time. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Sounds great. Some of you have also been asking just about how different people have been doing. Uh, Mac Bass, many of you know, had suffered a heart attack several weeks ago. He is home. He's doing so much better getting his stamina back but continue to pray for him. Uh, his ribs and sternum are still healing. Uh, the, several of those ribs were broken during the time that they were trying to uh, uh, get him back to us, if you will, and so continue to lift him up. And also, uh, Anthony and Maria Purcelli, mm -hmm. many of you have been praying for Anthony. Uh, Anthony, uh, many thought, had encephalitis, and he was really struggling there for a while, but he is back on track. They were actually here with us at the service last weekend, mm -hmm. and they're doing so much better, but continue to lift them up. And obviously, praying for our leaders locally and uh, nationally as well, that God would give them strength and real wisdom as we move through some of these next phases to mm -hmm. get a restart yeah. for our nation and sort of get back to normal. Uh, why don't we just have a prayer together Definitely. before we launch into our passage this morning. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for blessing us so much, for the privilege of being able to hear your word, to be able to sing, to find encouragement during these uh, really unusual times that we find ourselves. And we pray, God, that we would see you at work, that you would get all the honor and the glory and that we would be faithful in lifting others up to you as well. Our leaders, that they would receive tremendous wisdom and strength that they might be coming to you to find that. And we pray for those uh, like Mac and for Anthony and so many others, Lord, that are going through different things during this time, that you would bring healing, strength, blessing, and encouragement. For those who may even be struggling because they're out of work right now, we pray, Lord, that they might come to you to find peace and that you might open this door back up so that folks can get back to work 
and that we can get back on to what normalcy looks like. In the meantime, Father, we're grateful that during these times, in the eye of the storm, that you bring us to yourself so that we might find peace and strength moving forward. And we ask you for all of this help. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks, Ian. For the last number of weeks since we've transitioned to this new normal, uh, we've been spending time looking at what we call the fear factor. Uh, we, we looked at different elements on how we're not born to have fear or timidity, but we are supposed to be living in the strength and power of the Lord. We looked at, from Proverbs, the fact that we are supposed to have an, an awe or a reverence for Him during this time. And hopefully, you found encouragement over the last four weeks dealing with this idea of fear factor and anxiety and able to process uh, all of this change in a really helpful way so that when you get up the next day, rather than looking at just the news and, and looking at maybe the amount of people that are contracting the virus or looking at the fact that maybe you've lost your job, we're able to find strength in the Lord being able to move forward. Well, we're going to transition today out of the fear factor and back to the series that we were in in the early parts of this year, and that was called Mission Impossible. We started a new series looking at the book of Jeremiah, and Jeremiah completely had a mission that was impossible. God gave him a challenge to communicate his word to a people group that weren't going to listen no matter what. He was given a job, if you will, to say something that was true, do what was right, knowing in advance that nobody would respond. How would you like to be called into that kind of position? I mean, most of us thrive when we're given opportunity to excel, when we see results in what's going on with our work. We're, we're very tangibly oriented that way. But here was a guy that was given this spiritual task, and he was told up front that almost no one is going to respond to this message. And along the way, you need to keep doing this, even at the cost and the risk of your own life. Well, as we rolled on through the chapters, we find ourselves in chapter 13 today. And what we see is that God is bringing to the forefront the whole issue of why the people of Israel wouldn't listen to the Lord's words anyway. And I think what we're going to find is it's the same problem that we all have. Jamie alluded to that when they sang that second song this morning, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Just absolutely love that song. Because if God's going to have his way in our life, the only way that that's going to take place is if you and I allow him to crush the pride that is so ever-present with us on a regular basis. I mean, this whole idea of pride brings us all the way back to Adam and Eve. This is really, as some would say, the first sin. This is that which drives so many of the other things that control our life. And what God is going to do through the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 13 is to come to the place to say, if you're going to turn, you must allow me to crush pride in your life. And that same message rings true for us today. If you and I are going to see any growth in our Christian walk, if we're going to see any development in our life for the Lord, we need to let God into our life to crush the pride that is so ever-present and let him take over. What I find interesting, particularly with the Old Testament prophets, is sometimes God uses some very unusual methodology to communicate his points. Here in Jeremiah, to kick off chapter 13, he's going to use two different symbols to bring the people to an understanding of this whole idea of pride. The first thing that he uses is a, a sash, or sometimes it's referred to as a belt. And then there's another illustration that he uses, and that is old wineskins. And we'll see how the text unfolds in just a minute. But that's really not the most unusual tools that God has used to bring people to himself. If you were to go to Isaiah chapter 20, Isaiah, again, a prophet of the Lord, he was trying to communicate truth to the people of Israel, and the people weren't listening again. Surprise, surprise, we kind of have the same situation going on. We're a bit obstinate at times. 
God says to Isaiah in chapter 20, he says, I want you to walk around in your undergarments for three years to prove a point to the people. Now, if I was a prophet and God asked me to do that, that would not be a pretty sight. But he obeyed, he followed through, and the whole point of that was as the people laughed at him and, and mocked him for doing that, God's point was, one day, there's going to be a people group from another nation, and we know that now to be the Assyrians from Nineveh, and they are going to come, and they are literally going to take everything from you so that when you look around at yourself, it would be as if you were naked and you had nothing. And sometimes what God does, he has to remove everything that's important to us to bring us to himself. Later in the book of Ezekiel, we find a similar situation. God asked Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 4, he said to him, I want you to lay down on your left side and then lay down on your right side, back and forth, for a whole year to prove a point that the people weren't willing to change. They were always uh, fickle. They were always willing to do what they wanted, but they weren't willing to change for him. There were other situations that went on in Ezekiel's life as well. In fact, later on in that book, Ezekiel, who was married, unfortunately sees his wife pass away. And God said, I don't even want you to show any sorrow for the loss of your wife. He says, this is a picture of what's going on with the people of Israel. They don't even see the depths of their own sin. They're not sorry for it. They don't have any remorse for it. And that's exactly what pride does to us in our life. So over and over and over again, God uses these very graphic illustrations to try to bring us to himself. Back to Jeremiah in chapter 13. He says, Jeremiah, what I want you to do is I want you to get this sash and I want you to wear it like a belt. And I don't want you to ever take it off for a long period of time. And then what I want you to do is I want you to travel a long distance to the river Euphrates. Now, some say in the scriptures that this was a huge distance, hundreds of miles. And then he says, I want you to take it off and I want you to lie it down by the river come all the way back, and then go back up there again. This would take weeks. And I want you to tell me what it looks like. And of course, at that point, the sash would be utterly ruined and destroyed. Let's pick it up in Jeremiah chapter 13, beginning in verse 8. Then I received this message from the Lord. This is what the Lord says. This shows us how I will rot away the pride of Judah and Jerusalem. He's using this sash as a picture. They stubbornly follow their own desires and worship other gods. Therefore, they will become like this loincloth or belt, good for nothing. As a loincloth clings to a man's waist, so I created Judah and Israel to cling to me, says the Lord. Now, what I find interesting about this word cling, it's not used all that often in the Old Testament. In fact, you have to go back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, when it says, a man will leave his father and mother, and he will cling to his wife, and the two will be one flesh. It's the same word. The word here means to be able to stick like glue. So let me read this verse again. As a loincloth clings like glue to the man's waist, so I created Judah and Israel to cling to me. They were to be my people. They were to be my pride, my glory, and honor to my name, but they wouldn't listen to me. So God has designed us to cling to him, to stick like glue to him. But what happens is pride often gets in the way and destroys that relationship. Now, once God moves out of this whole idea of the sash, he goes into the next illustration beginning in verse 12. He says this to Jeremiah. So tell them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. May all of your jars be filled with wine. And they will reply, well, of course, jars are being made to be filled with wine. I mean, this was, an, this was an obvious kind of duh comment that God was saying. But he had an extremely important lesson for them. What looked to be so obvious 
that you and I are to be clinging to the Lord with our life? And they even responded to what the obvious was. God brings this illustration to fruition. Listen to these words. Then tell them. Now, this is what the Lord means by this. I will fill everyone in this land with drunkenness, from the king sitting on David's throne to the priests and the prophets, right down to the common people. Did you get that? The priests, the prophets, and all of the people. That's just about everyone. And I will, listen, I will smash them against each other, even parents against children, says the Lord, and I will not let my pity or my mercy or my compassion keep me from destroying them. They said, sure, Lord, this is obvious. You've given us the jars to be filled. And God says, you're, you're missing the point. The point is, you're supposed to be clinging to me. You saw what was obvious, and yet you see it with the jars filled with wine, but you don't see it in how you're supposed to have your relationship with me. Why do we do that? Why do we allow pride to get in the way of our life? Why do we allow it to destroy us? Look at what he does moving on. So we, we see the symbols of pride through the sash and through the wine jars, but we also see the blindness of pride as well moving forward. Let's pick it up, if we could, in verse 15. He says, listen and pay attention. Don't be arrogant, for the Lord has spoken. Give glory to the Lord before it's too late. Acknowledge him before he brings darkness upon you, causing you to stumble and fall into the darkening mountains. For then, when you look for light, you will find only terrible darkness and gloom. And if you still refuse to listen, I will weep alone because of your pride. You know what he does here with this picture? He pictures somebody who goes out in the mountains, and suddenly darkness comes upon them, and they're not prepared. They're looking for light, he says, but they can't find it. And they're stumbling around in the darkness. And that's what pride does. Pride often blinds us to the obvious. Rather than being prepared and moving forward, these folks were caught and they didn't know which way to go. And rather than bringing the proper equipment to handle the situation in which they were in, they decided that they wouldn't worry about it and they were caught. So last, last night, uh, we had the privilege of having Elizabeth and Jonah and Ashlyn over. We had, a, we had a great time. Davey was at work, and we were just, we had fun outside. We went over to the horse farm next door to us, and we fed the horses with carrots and fresh apples, and it was really a great time. One of the things that Jonah loves to do is he loves to build this train set that I have. It's an electric chain set, and uh, it's an HO set. And many of you probably have those and put them around your Christmas tree at Christmas time. But he laughed, pop up, he says, can we get the train set out again? So we did. We've been having a little bit of trouble with it. And you know me in fixing things. That's always even a greater disaster once I get involved with stuff. But, ah, I did have some WD-40. Sprayed the bottom of the train set, all of the different couplings together. And voila, the thing worked amazing. Of course, my pride got in the way a little bit. Most of you, you're thinking, what? Uh, that's a piece of cake. But for me, that was a huge deal to get that working. And to see Jonah's joy as that train set worked fully operationally, and it was awesome. Well, the, the lead train, of course, the engine, has a built-in light. And I was wondering, wouldn't that be cool if we could watch the train go around at night? So I said something. I said to Jonah... Here's what I'm going to do, Jonah. You're going to be gone by the time it gets dark, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a video for you, and I'm going to send this video to you before you go to bed. I thought that was simple enough, and probably for 99.9% .9 of you out there, that's exactly what that would have been. Got my phone out. They had all left and gone home, and I found out how to take the video did the video, and the really cool thing, our cat had come in the room, and the cat was just sitting there in front of the train set, watching the train zoom around, and I was able to get the cat watching the train. I thought, this is going to be cool. They're going to love this. Took the video, could not figure out for the life of me how to send it to them. I was texting it to them. I was doing all kinds of things, and it wouldn't send. Now, pride got in the way because I was happy that we got the train set up, and then I allowed, believe it or not, 
a little bit of my anger to get in the way. I said, how simple can this be? And I can't figure it out. Davey, my son-in-law, he had gotten home from work. He sends this one comment to me. He says, hey, why don't you try sending it through Facebook Messenger? Well, sure enough, that worked. They got to see it. And Jonah was absolutely thrilled. You know what I found interesting for me? I got angry because I couldn't figure out how to send a tiny clip. And that's how pride works. Pride blinds us to the reality that is around us. And it makes things more important than they actually are. I was so humbled by that experience last night. And it was as if God was saying, see, this is exactly what I'm talking about. You're willing to let a 10-second video get in the way of an absolutely spectacular day, things that went awesome. You had a wonderful opportunity to spend with your family, and you're willing to let 10 seconds get in the way and ruin your life. And we do this all the time. What is it that we're allowing to get in the way? Maybe it's not a brief video clip for you. Maybe it's a relationship that you've allowed to get in the way. Maybe it's been pride about how you're handling a situation or not handling a situation. Maybe it's a circumstance that you have allowed to completely overwhelm you and take over your life. What pride often does is it often blinds us to the reality of what we know to be true. God brings symbols into our life all the time to remind us of his love and blessing, that we are to be clinging to him as the original design. He also shows us how pride can bring blindness. But he wraps this whole chapter up with what are the consequences to all of this? And in the minds of the people of Israel, they really weren't worried about the consequences. And that is part of our problem. We don't look beyond the situation in which we find ourselves. We, we think that God's just going to forgive and forget. And often that is not the case. Yeah, he'll forgive. But sometimes the consequences moving forward are extraordinarily challenging. Let's wrap this up beginning in verse 22. He says, you may ask yourself, why is all this happening to me? Is it because of your many sins? This is why you have been stripped and totally taken care of by your invading armies. Listen to this. Can an Ethiopian change the color of his skin? Can a leopard take away its spots. And the response in the Hebrew is, no, you can't do that. And yet, what the people were doing here is they were saying, oh, we're just going to change ourselves and we're not going to worry about it. And God says, no, I don't think so. You can't change yourself on your own. You've got to come to me. And that's why I've set this up the way I have. This whole idea of relationship with God is designed so that we would consistently come to him on a regular basis. But we often look to ourselves for change and development. And God's saying here, I don't think so. This isn't the way that this works. The Bible says, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in this delight, does he take pleasure day and night? He shall be like a tree that is planted by the rivers of water that will bring forth fruit in his season. Verse 4 says this in Psalm 1, But the chaff are not so, they are like the wind that drives it away. By you and I trying to change ourselves by ourselves, God says you're nothing but chaff that the wind drives away. But if you come to me and you cling to me as the original design was, God says, I will literally crush your pride, bring you into relationship with me, and you can experience what life in Christ is all about. This is the design, and yet the people of Israel wouldn't listen. Are we listening? Are we listening to the voice of God as he speaks to us through his word, as he brings words through songs to us, people in our lives that are trying to bring us back? To him. Are we listening? I've had the privilege of reading through this book by C.S. Lewis printed in 1945. It's called Beyond Personality. 
And I'm not going to read this whole segment to you, but at the end, this principle of giving up ourselves is so unbelievably important. He says the principle runs through from top to bottom. Give up yourself and you will find your real self. Lose your life and you will save it. Submit to death, the death of your ambitions and your favorite wishes every day and the death of your whole body in the end. Submit with every fiber of your being and you will find eternal life. Keep nothing back. Nothing that you will have not given away will ever re really be yours anyway. Nothing in you that is not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself and you will find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But look for Christ and you will find him and with him everything else thrown in. Will we allow God to crush our pride so that we might find him, live in him, and know what it means to have not only life here in this world, but life eternal as we've come to faith in him. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you so much for being willing to crush our pride. I pray that we might be listening to you, that, God, we might be turned as your spirit works in our life, that we might be willing to submit completely unto you, so that you might have your way with us. And we ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ and his name. Amen. At this time, we'd like to close out uh, service with our last song. We turn things over to Jamie as we close out. Thanks for joining us today. I give you all my life. I'm letting it go.
in the rest of this week, that you just uh, take what we are and that you, um, you know, just take these hands, take these feet and use them for your purpose. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Great song to end our service today. Uh, thank Jamie and Michael and Gail and Paul for leading us today. And thank you for joining us at home for this Sunday service, April 18th, 2020. We hope that you have an absolutely fantastic rest of your day, and we look forward to you joining us again next weekend. Have a great Sunday, everyone.